You're on the clock with Tyler Jennings and Jared Perkins. A Prospects Live podcast for everything MLB draft related. Join us as we discuss the biggest stories from college and high school baseball. Bring new interviews from your favorite draft prospects and break down live looks with Prospects Live analysis across the nation. Get ready because you're on the clock with Tyler Jennings and Jared Perkins. All right, welcome back to another episode of On the Clock. A little different uh, intro this time. Uh, Jared's not here right now. He's having a little bit of technical difficulties with his computer. Um, but you'll see him later on when we have our interview with Pitt assistant coach and former Cincinnati Red, Devin Mazzarocco, later on in the show. Um, but for right now, you've just got a sad Panthers fan. Sad Panthers fan Tyler here. Um, <laughs> uh but luckily, we're not here to talk about football today because uh, I already have enough depression from the Carolina Panthers playing anyways. But I'm going to try something a little bit different here. Um, I've been tinkering with an idea that I want to do for a little bit, which is essentially breaking down the film that we have here at the site. Um, now, if you haven't seen any of our film, uh, we have a YouTube channel under Prospects Live. And essentially, all of the video that we have that we get the fields are put into our playlist over there. So we have minor league playlists. We have 2023, 2024, 2025 uh, amateur playlists that we're working on. And they're going to be continued to be uploading throughout the whole year. Um, all the footage that you're going to see today is mainly from the collegiate national team. And any video you see you know, in the future could be, you know, collegiate national team, PDP, anything from the spring, like Will did uh, East Coast Pro this year. And, and there's a bunch of other stuff that we've done as well. So, you know, I want to give everyone else a shout out. They've all done amazing with what they do. And I can't thank them for their hard work enough. Um, Jared, especially. I know he's not here right now, um, but Jared puts a heart and soul into this. So I figure I'd give you a shout out before we go and dive into this. But yeah, essentially, I just want to break down film here. Um, now, what we're going to do here, the first edition of this is just going to be um, from Collegiate National Team. This is going to be Tennessee Volunteers starting pitcher Drew Beam. Um, Drew Beam is a little bit of background on him. Uh, got the Sunday role as a freshman in the SEC and did a very, very good job at it. Um Really locked down that spot behind Chase Burns and Chase Dolander in 2022 before Blake Tidwell came back. And then he did the same this year as well in the same role. He was behind Chase Burns and Chase Dolander again. Um, there was a little bit of a uh, regression this year. Um, just kind of looking at the stats that he has from 2022, he had a sub three ARA, um, two and a half walks per nine respectable numbers in 76 innings and he struck out 62 in 2023 the era jumped up to 3.7 um had 84 in the third inning struck out 96 similar walk rates but he got hit up more um had allowed 88 hits throughout the year compared to i do believe it was 60 or at least like 50 um somewhere in that range in 2022 um so there was some aggression this year, but it's still really good strike throwing. And I kind of want to break down how I would evaluate somebody either in person or on film. Um, so I'm giving you guys a little deep dive into what I kind of do at the field. And this is something that I try and tell the other guys here, you know, this is what we want to do. Um, I've had the gratitude of having guys that have previously worked with us um, that have really mentored me and I can't thank them enough for what they've done. And there's still a lot for me to learn. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into this. The first thing I kind of look at with at least a starting pitcher, let's look at delivery here. Um, this is warm-ups. Um, you'll probably see more of it as we get into the in-game footage here in a couple minutes. But really loose, really easy, um, pretty athletic mover down the mound, um, pretty repeatable as well. He does a pretty good job of repeating his mechanics and going down the hill. Um, there's not a ton of effort involved here, which is good. And you can see the velos of all the pitches down there. Um, we'll get into that here in a second. But, you know, he's got this 30 build. He's 6'4", 208. He's got that workhorse build that can make everything work out. Um, the main thing with Drew Beam, in my opinion, is maybe he throws a bit too many strikes. Um, when I, what I mean by that is covering the zone too much, and it's giving hitters uh, – better way to really see the stuff. Um, his stuff has gone up in 2023 compared to 2022. Uh, that's another thing I'll get into here in a minute. Um, but with Beam, it's like I've mentioned the back-end starter theme. Um, 
you know, when we look at the 2024 board that we have up, you know, the first tier collegiate arms is Chase Burns, Brody Brecht, and you can throw Hagen Smith into that as well because he's been up to 100 this fall. Um, those are the three big arms that we have in this class. Beams in that second tier below that with Trey Savage, Thatcher Hur can be prime examples that we brought up here. You know, if Ben Hess was healthy, I think Ben Hess probably slots into that either, you know, upper echelon with the first three or he's in this tier with Drew Beam. Um, but he has the stuff to be a back end starter. He can eat up innings. I would like to see the stuff get a little bit better in 2024. Um, because when you look at the stuff that you see from 2022 to 2023, um, all the whiff rates went up. It was 13% on the fastball in 2022, 2023 went up to 20%, which isn't necessarily the greatest number to have on a four seam fastball, but it still plays and it's gone up. Um, now, when I talk about fastball metrics, you know, as we're watching a couple of really good curveballs here, um, the fastball with Drew Beam's interesting. It's a steep release. It's about 6.3 on the release height uh, in terms of feet and gets good extension. His VL actually jumped from 2023 to 2023. Um, it was mainly sitting in the low 90s in 2022. Got up more into the mid 90s this year. Average about 94. It has been up to 98 as well this year. In this film, we have him up to 97. Sat 93, 95 throughout the outing. Um, it's it's a good fastball, at least when you look at it from the data span point. It's got some good carry to it. The thing that really kills it is the downhill plane to it and that high release. Um, when we talk about vertical approach angle, which is essentially the angle that the pitch comes to the plate, um, when you're looking for at least like an average on that, you're looking around negative five degrees. If any, if you're anything below that, you're looking at something really good. If it's above that, like what Drew Beam has, which is like a negative 5.4, negative 5.5, it's got steep plane to it. Um, and you kind of wonder maybe he's a candidate for a sinker to a two seamer. Uh, maybe to give them something that gets the hitters off the four seamer. Um, but essentially you would like to see that number come down if you want to miss more bats. Now the jump from 13 to 20 is pretty good. Um, and that may be just because of the fact that he's in the zone more. Um, but he does like to work the lower half of the zone with the fastball, land at the knees, work horizontally. That's kind of like the the bread and butter for like a sinker baller or a ground ball guy. Um so maybe we start seeing that at some point. Uh, the velo being up is a good thing for him, and I feel like there might be more on the way. Um, there is some projection to that body. You add some more mass to it, more muscle. You might be able to get some more velo out of it. Um, but, you know, with that being said, maybe it's, at this point you could probably just put like a 50 grade on the fastball. Um, you know, yes, the velo is there. Really good curveball there, by the way. Um, but realistically – when I kind of look at that kind of stuff, I really depend on how successful the basketball is at missing bats. Um, if you're looking for something good, like 25%, maybe a bit higher. If you see 30%, you're doing really, really good. Um, prime example, Chase Dolaner missed like 30% bats this year with a fastball. His VAA was like negative 4.1, negative 4.2. Um, that's the kind of fastball you put a 60 grade on with the kind of VLA that Dolander has. Uh, Beam does have that velocity. It's not the fringy, you know, upper 80s, low 90s kind of guy. This is a guy that sits around 94. But the shape and the lack of consistency of missing bats kind of just dumps it down for me a little bit. Maybe at some point you improve the shape. I can see the above average happening, but I don't know if you can go plus with this. I think average is probably the best way to describe it right now. Now, the curveball. The curveball is a really, really good pitch. You've seen a couple of it here. Um, he actually threw curveballs more in this outing than fastballs, and there were two change-ups in here. Um, we can get to the change-up later. But the curveball is, in my opinion, his best pitch. Um, I grade it as above average. It has, you know, right there, you can see it, good tilt. Throws it hard in the upper eight, or not upper 80s, but the lower 80s. Um, in the 79 to 81 range, you can catch 82, 83. Now, in 2022, this was more of like a slurvy breaking ball. It was really tough to pick out if it was a slider or a curveball. This year, it showed more of a curveball shape. This It can start as 11-5 shape, which is essentially, if you look at the clock, that's kind of just how the direction moves on it. Um, he'll have some more lateral uh, tilt to it, kind of like right there, 10-4 to shape. Doesn't have a ton of spin. It's really mainly around the 2100, 2200 spin range. Um, but when you have a shape like that, it definitely works out in your favor. The spin is not end-all, be-all, at least in my opinion. Um, but 
he's able to miss more bats with it. It, it actually jumped up from 33% whiff rate in 2022 to 37% in 2023. Right there is a really good curveball to Austin O'Vern. Um, I think it's his best, like I said, best pitch. Um, he's can lose the shape a little bit, um, especially as outings go on. Um, he can kind of spike the ball a little bit, kind of turns into more of like a, a sweepy slider. Um, but when it's at his best, it's a 11 5 shape with some horizontal at the very end. Um, can really land it whenever he likes. Um, but essentially, like that fastball curveball is his bread and butter. That's the best two pitches that he has in his arsenal. Now, when we talk about the remainder, he did have a cutter this year, mainly to righties. It's a firm offering in the upper 80s, gets up to 89. Um, he didn't throw it in this outing, but he did throw it in an outing I saw against Texas A&M in March. Um, didn't miss a bat with it if he can locate it low and away. He does land it for strikes about 70% of the time, but it, it doesn't have that kind of bite you would expect it to have for someone that's going to say, oh, hey, it's an average offering or above average like the curveball has. I think it's more of a fringy pitch at the moment. You can add some um, bite to it, add some snap to it to get it up to that average grade, but I think it's more fringy at the moment. Um, same for the changeup. Changeup's a lefty-only pitch, um, so he has the two pitches to go to you know one side of the plate, but the changeup has decent fading life to it. You could probably put average on it, but I think maybe it's fringy right now because the feel kind of is off and on with it a little bit. Um, he also throws it really hard. It's about 89 to 90. Um, here it was 86 to 89. Um, but the changeup kind of has to improve a little bit next year, in my opinion. He, Like I said earlier in the video, he got hit up a little bit. I think the changeup was kind of the reason why, because he didn't have an effective out pitch against lefties. Uh, the same can be said for the cutter against righties. But, you know, changeup, I think could probably be average at some point. It does have a little less velocity separation from the fastball that you'd like, and he kind of does slow the arm down just a little bit. Um, but it's nothing too major, and I think Frank Anderson can work him out of that a little bit. Um, but essentially what you're looking at here is four pitches, two of which are average or better, two of which that we're looking at probably – Fringy at the moment. You see any um, changes in 2024 can improve a little bit, but overall it's a well-rounded arsenal. He throws strikes. It's a good delivery. Um, there's a ton to like here. And, you know, maybe at some point the stuff does get better. You could see a middle rotation guy if things do work out that way. Um, but all in all, I think this is a, a bit back, 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 back end guy. Um, throws a ton of strikes, decent floor, has some upside, kind of akin to what Rhett Ladder was before his stuff kind of exploded in 2023, especially the slider. Um, if we see something like that with Beam, that's amazing. You know, uh, Rhett Ladder's slider went from average to I put a plus grade on it. Um, I don't know if Beam does that with the cutter or whatever he adds this offseason, but it's a really, really good arsenal. I like the kid a lot. I think he's, like I said, he's in that second tier of college arms. Um, we'll see how everything goes out. And he'll be the Friday night guy in Knoxville with potentially AJ Russell, Wyatt Evans is coming back. Um, I'm pretty excited for the Tennessee Volunteers um, pitching staff they have this year. Nate Snead came over for Wichita State. He's a flamethrower that they have over there now. Um, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by what they got over there in Knoxville. And they got some pretty good bats. Uh, Blake Burke's up there. Um, Christian Moore, there will be some video on him at some point here. Um, but Christian Moore can absolutely slug the baseball. Um, but yeah, apart from that, that's kind of like a little in-depth uh, video breakdown here, uh, especially talking about Drew Beam himself. Um, the video can be linked whenever we release this. Um, not, we, We're not too sure what's going to happen considering uh, Jared's computer issues, but we'll see what happens. Um, I'm hoping everything gets sorted out with that because – like I said, Jerry puts his heart and soul into this, and there is nothing more that I can say than that. He does an amazing job. Um, same for everyone else here. Like, I might as well take my time to go ahead and appreciate everybody here because everybody that listens to this, y'all are amazing. You all do a great job. You got my appreciation from me. Um, but apart from that, you know, uh, if you guys want to send in any requests for guys that you want to see, just let us know. You can DM me. I have my DMs open or send a request. Um, we can definitely do that. I have filmed with most of these guys from Collegiate and PDP. Um, so just let me know who you want to see. I can break them down for you. Um, but aside from that, 
we're going to go ahead and get you some Devin Maserato. We we had the opportunity to go ahead and interview him. Jared's going to be part of this. It was a fun interview. I enjoyed it. Devin Maserato, really, really fun guy. 2007 first rounder, played for the Reds, all-star in 2014. He does a very good job of explaining what his job is as a coach and exactly what he did in the league and some of the guys that he's been able to work with and see um, J.J. Weatherholt was a guy he's seen, and he has some high praise for him. And that's very good to hear, considering the fact that J.J. Weatherholt is one of the best bats in the country and will likely be a top five pick this year. So without further ado, from Tyler Jennings, saying this for Jared Perkins, enjoy the interview. All right, everyone, we are back with another incredible interview for On the Clock, the uh, Prospects Live podcast is bringing you everything MLB draft related and amateur draft related. I'm Jared Perkins. That's Tyler Jennings. We have Devin Mezzarocco with us today, assistant coach at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Devin, how are you doing today? Good. How are you guys? Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, Always excited. happy to have someone on. Yeah, we're excited Definitely. to have you on, talk a little bit uh, about Pitt and all those fun things. Um, but uh, Devin, just for the people who don't know you, give a little bit of background on yourself. Um, your first round draft pick, right, with the the Cincinnati Reds. But talk a little bit about your journey of how you went to professional baseball and then made that transition now to college coaching. At the yeah, so I grew up in a very small town here in uh, Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Um, played ball all my life. My father was a coach and. Ended up getting drafted by the Reds in the first round of the 2007 draft. Uh, spent four years in the minor leagues. Ended up playing eight years in the big leagues. And uh, from there, we moved down to the Pittsburgh area. And I needed something to keep myself busy. So I, I kind of found a, a home there at the University of Pittsburgh Baseball. And it's been a very good fit where I get to still be involved in the game and help out, uh, you know, some players that are hoping to kind of uh, achieve some of the things that I did. That's incredible. Uh, Tyler, I'll kick it off to you. I know you've got a bunch of questions lined up. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I wanted to ask was what the draft process was like for you back in 07, because, I mean, I feel like it, considering it's been 16 years, it's probably been a little different for some of the newer guys around here, but kind of just give us your experience through that whole night and what it was like for you. Yeah, I think that the the process right now, like the the travel ball and the way that those things have taken off, you know, the the premier players are playing kind of nationally every single weekend. And I didn't do that growing up. Right. Like I played Legion baseball, uh, did the East Coast Pro in the area codes, but it was nothing along the lines of, of, of what some of these national teams do now. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just played locally was around the field, was at the, you know, almost every single day, get into the high school season. So I signed with the University of Virginia, the junior, summer of my junior year. And uh, I wasn't necessarily the highest profile guy at that time. I think that I was pretty committed to going to UVA and, you know, hopefully getting a chance once I got there. And uh, first game in, in, obviously in rural Pennsylvania, we're playing in the North, right? It's like 35 degrees. And there was like 18 scouts at the first game. And it was like, Oh, okay. Well, that's something. Um, and, um, like I had a couple home runs, did showed everything well, you know, at, so the previous summer I had Tommy John, so I wasn't throwing, but my arm had come back and it was really strong at that time. So I was, uh, I was able to kind of really show that off played good. You know, the competition is, it wasn't necessarily the strongest. So they would have me hit a lot of BP and um, really just try to see as much as they can in that regard. So it was, it was a different process than a lot of what people do now when it, when they're traveling and they have the data and they have all the information of the top prospects where they're seeing them face 90 mile an hour pitching every single week. And uh, yeah, it was a lot different for me. No, that, I mean, that's cool though. Still nonetheless, like, I mean, I, Jared, you're not from the North, I don't think, but. No, no, I'm, I'm from like the New England area though. So you get the cold weather up there um, and kind of the, the not so much of getting the, the big scouts into those games and stuff like that. So you are from the North. 
A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you mentioned the Tommy John, you know, the junior summer that you had. Um, what was that like specifically, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so I was pitching in my high school season. Uh, not a good arm. You know, I was like 89, 91 at that time as a sophomore. And, um, yeah, just felt it kind of go there one day and – Tried to rehab it and that didn't work and had the surgery. And, you know, like, I think that when you go through those things, there's always some scare. Uh, but we had some good people around to kind of that had been through it before, a good therapist that would help me out. And it uh, it was more of just kind of putting it in the work and knowing that it'll come back. And, yeah, I mean, my arm was by junior year. I didn't throw it all in high school and then ramping up in the uh, – the area codes in that, I was just throwing a little bit. Um, you know, say we went to East Coast Pro, I didn't throw there, but I would throw at the area code game, something along those lines. And uh, then by the time my senior year rolled around, I was perfectly fine. Oh, that's good to hear. Jared, do you got any questions? Yeah, I was going to say that you touched on a little bit, right, having to come over that, overcome that adversity of Tom and John, but also the pressures and all the things that you had to experience with like being a first rounder in the MLB draft. How have you taken those experiences and helped uh, translate and work with the guys that you're working now at Pitt, right? Getting them prepared for any of the opportunities that may, may have. Um, what's been like your, exp the, taking those experiences, what has that been like for you kind of teaching the, the next generation of athletes? Yeah, I think that, the mental side of this game is almost certainly the most difficult side of it, right? Yeah. When it comes to dealing with the pressures and the pressures that guys put up themselves and the pressures that they have from behind the scenes and yeah, trying to overcome some difficult times. And, you know, I, I'm well versed when it comes to difficult times, you know, so I, I, I didn't have success very early in my minor league career. I had a number of injuries that I had to battle through. So, those things all come very easy to me. And I have a lot of conversations with our guys in regards to that stuff and controlling what you can control. And, and you know, like the, the results are what they are, but you can control the effort you put in. You can control the, uh, you know, the way that you show up each day. So th those are things that I kind of preach to those guys. But, yeah, I have a, I have a lot of uh, a lot of history with with adverse time so it works out very well in the role that i play at the moment yeah i love that and i i think the the big thing that uh you really touch on right is controlling what you can control when i worked baseball operations at nevada like guys were so fixated on where they're going to get picked and a lot of times the coaching staff are just telling them look you don't aren't really going to be able to control where you get picked right so so many different factors are going to go into that decision whether it's like scouts showing up to games and all those kind of things like all you can do is kind of control what you're going to do the output that you're going to put on the field and just go from there right and so i think that's a huge thing that you hit on yeah for sure for sure it's uh it is something that uh i think that at some point in time every ball player will go through right uh, yeah Everybody will be humbled in this game. Everybody will run into a, a bad day along the way. So, yeah, it's how you get back up and, and, and really how you continue to work and progress that is what really matters. Yeah, yeah. that can be said for any athlete, too, like just any other sport, it's the same deal. Yeah. Yes, for sure. It, it, it is such a – you know, there, there's a lot that goes into the mental side of the game and uh, to have, you know, somebody that sucked a lot like me, you know, it, it's really helpful for my players. <laughs> yeah, you still got a really good weekly career out of it though, too. You know, uh, do you think you're selling yourself a little short there, but yeah, I definitely think that you, you definitely got some good experience and can really translate to that to those guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, so now that you go into the, the pit season, um, you went from what being a volunteer assistant now to a full-time assistant. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen this fall that you're really is getting you excited for 2024 and the, the upcoming season? Yeah, I think we have a lot of new guys and, you know, I like yeah. the new, when we have the turnover, the challenges of getting guys up to speed, um, uh, you got to coach a lot. And I, I kind of like that aspect where, you know, you really have to go into this thing and 
think one thing that our head coach, Coach Bell, says is you have to mold them into what you want, right? Like if they aren't doing uh, the fundamentals correctly, you have to make sure that they do it. And if my catchers – and I, I run the catchers, obviously, with my background down there, and uh, my catchers aren't doing things when it comes to receiving correctly, it's my job to fix that. So it, it – uh, no, it's been good. We have uh, a lot of new arms – a lot of competition. We'll see how this thing plays out. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it should should be a very fun year. I'm excited for it, honestly. Yeah, the ACC, right? Like, uh, it's always going to be a challenge for us to compete uh, with Northern School, and you know, it's a very very tough conference when it comes to trying to compete at the at the high end of the league. So yeah, it. it uh, I kind of like the underdog status in some respects, you know, where like we will almost always be picked to finish near the bottom, but that's okay. That doesn't mean you have to finish there, right? The, everything looks a little bit different on paper than what it will at the end of the year. And uh, I think that we have to continue to make strides, can continue to compete and show that we can, you know, um, compete against the, the higher end teams in the ACC. Yeah, 100%. And I know last year, like, I think you guys were like, what, the 10 or 11 seed at the tournament in Durham? Yeah, we, we backdoored our way in. We kind of snuck in there. <laughs> we didn't finish the strongest, but it, uh, yeah, it was good to get in the tournament. We, we, we can be a tough out once we get into the tournament. And, you know, uh, we ended up beating Notre Dame there. And, uh, yeah, we ran into Brett Louder and Wake Forest. So that was a challenging one for sure. <laughs> No, I think I remember that too because I think you guys barreled up ladder a little bit early on. Didn't you yeah, just we. So the plan going into it, we wanted to be very aggressive and get them off the fastball, right? And um, so we we were had some success, and I think we scored a run or two in the first or second inning. But he can pitch any game, you know. Like uh, if guys are being very aggressive to his fastball, he can go to his secondaries more so and once he did that, that 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 kind of ended things for us but yeah he uh <laughs> he he just has the ability to and that's what big league starters can do right like they can execute any pitch in any spot they can throw any game and yeah he, he's going to be very very good but yeah that was that was kind of our best shot at it and you know it didn't quite work. Hey, valiant effort nonetheless, you know. Yeah, nobody beat him. Like so what what uh, yeah. <laughs> did he lose in the college world series? I, I I don't even remember. But yeah, it's not like it we went uh had to tuck our tail between our legs. I think he was like 14 to 0 or something along those lines. Yeah. And I, I don't yeah. even think he lost in the skeins duel either, because that was off of uh Menachi, I think. Okay, yeah. So yeah, he was undefeated for the year. Yeah, he was awesome. Very, very good high end pitcher. You know, like that. Uh, that is what they look like. And he's a red now. Yeah, yeah. No, it's cool. I, so the when we played him in Pittsburgh here, and Pittsburgh's easy to get in and out of. So the GM and the guy who kind of does the minor league pitching analytic side of things were both in town, and I I played with the guy that does that stuff now, and I I knew Nick pretty good for well, I think he's president of baseball operations now but anyway I knew him very good so they came and said hello and I knew that there would be uh some real interest in in Rhett you know like just uh, he's one that man just don't go out there and screw it up uh he, he's just right you know he can do it all right he and I think a lot of people at, during the draft kind of compared him to Mike Lee. And uh, I caught Leaker's first bullpen whenever mm. he was drafted. And he gets in there, you know, a 30-pitch bullpen, sinker to both sides, cutter to both sides, breaking ball to both sides of the plate, change up to both sides of the plate. Now, he didn't have the stuff, you know, like nearly – but it was like, well, what do we have to develop with this guy? Like, you know, like, uh, what are you going to teach him? I, I don't know. Like, he, he, he can kind of do everything already. I, I don't know. It's not like you're going to change the shape of his fastball and get him like a big riding four seamer. You know, that's just not who he is. Uh, so I, I think that that comparison with Rhett to Mike Leake is just, you know, the kid is very advanced and already can do everything, you know, just – Get him some innings and, and uh, don't mess that one up. Keep him healthy. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you you guys even had two arms drafted last year. I think it was Logan Ellen Evans and uh, Dylan Simmons were two guys I got drafted. So did how what were they like uh, if you ever had a chance to like work with them or anything like that? So we've done very good with power arms that we can bring in and help them kind of navigate a game and help them pitch and help them use their secondary. So our, our head coach does the pitching coach, Mike Bell, and he is very, very good when it comes to pitching backwards and forcing these guys to use their off speed and getting them comfortable with those things. And I would say that both of those guys were kind of along, you know, Logan was a big power arm that we got from Penn state that, you know, had some control and command issues first year over here, man, the stuff was really good. You know, like uh, it was just he would leave stuff over the middle plate, couldn't pitch backwards, would just fall behind at times and then have to throw fastballs. And then the second the, the last year he showed really good flashes of being able to do those things when it comes to landing that breaking ball. And um, we had him throw in a sinker last year, which helped him out. Uh, so yeah, he was, he was a really good example. And Dylan was a guy from Florida state that kind of had some problems down there getting on the mound, wasn't getting the people out, you know, was a big power arm, strong, strong kid. Uh and his slider kind of really took off when he got to us. And uh, mm-hmm. that was, I remember like the, we had a bullpen there at the very beginning of the year. And he was mixing in a curveball. And we just said, hey, man, like that curveball is not, a, it's just a show me pitch. Like that isn't what we need. We need to continue to get this slider to where it needs to be. And uh, next time out, he threw like 50% sliders. And then it was like, yeah, this is this is who that guy is supposed to be, right? Like, he doesn't have the best fastball shape. It's kind of straight. Uh, he wasn't going to have a big swing and miss fastball. But there was – and it wasn't like a slider that would jump off the page with the horizontal movement or, you know, anything crazy. But nobody ever hit it. Uh, and they just could not square that thing up. And it was just like, yeah, just keep throwing that, man. Like this, this isn't that hard. Just, just go out there and, and, and do your thing. So it, um, yeah, those, those, those are the type of arms that we've done well with. And I think we'll, we'll do some, some of the same with a few of the guys that we have this year. Perfect. Are there a couple of guys this fall that are really standing out to you? Yeah. So we had an arm from Rhode Island, Ryan Andrade, um, he was, he was used as a closer from Rhode, at Rhode Island. Uh, it's been very loud this fall, you know, like it's in, and it's in shorter stints in the fall season, right? You throw one or two innings, but I mean, he's been four to six with the, like touch 98 with good off speed, two different breaking balls, the end of change up. It's just kind of dialing them in, you know, like, uh, we would love for that kid to be able to give us six, seven innings. It's just a matter of, we have to be efficient with our pitches if you're going to start. We have to be able to pitch backwards if you're going to start. So seeing how all that evolves throughout the season, but it's a real arm, you know, like it's a, he's not a big physical kid. There's still some projection left. So it, it, it's a real, uh, it's an interesting guy for sure. Cool. And I think you also mentioned you'd awesome. seen JJ Weatherholt uh, recently, or at least that's what Jared sent me the text of. Um, any thoughts on JJ? I, I know he's. Yeah, he, he, you know, like, so obviously going against Wake first, we played uh, Kurtz. And uh, to me, those two guys just completely jump off the page, right? Like where, mm-hmm. man, this these are completely no brainers. Like these, these guys are what it looks like. And, and JJ, like. I don't know. There's some people that question kind of like his defense and maybe he's going to have to play third base. I, I didn't see that at all. Like he's plenty athletic to play up the middle. Yeah. He, he'll play second base for me. Uh, you know, and uh, the bat, like you could never fool him. Like the, our best bet, hopefully this year, will just be to put him on first base. I, I don't really know what else they have, but like <laughs> he was always on everything. Like there wasn't any, uh, 
bad swings. You couldn't really sneak a fastball by him. It was just, you know, and he doesn't walk a lot because he just puts the barrel on everything. You know, like it's, it's, uh, it, it's very, very polished, really, really going to be a good player. Excited for that. And he's at shortstop this year too. So I've heard everything like they've said. Yeah, I, I, He's super, like he's plenty athletic. He made two or three plays that literally uh, nobody else on the field would have made like for against us. Uh, he made a play going to his left. He made a backhand play. Like it was like, yeah, these, what, I don't really understand why people uh, <laughs> say he's going to have to play third base or this or that. Like he's plenty athletic. I think he'll be just fine at second base in, in the pro bowl. He can play short this year for sure. Like, uh, but long-term. Yeah, man, he, he's, he's a heck of a player. Excited, very yeah. excited. That's we'll, awesome. Uh, and we've talked. A- oh, go ahead. We'll have to keep them. Yeah, we'll have to keep them busy walking to first whenever we play them in a pit. <laughs> Sometimes you can't help it with those guys. They just you just know they're going to go out and perform every single time. Yeah, they, there's nothing you can do against them. Like it's just you might yeah. as well step off and throw it in the gap and you know call it a day. Same pitches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love it. Uh, we've talked a little bit about a couple MLB draft guys. Yeah, like you said yourself, you were a first rounder in the MLB draft. Um, but you said you also had an opportunity to experience the Cincinnati Reds draft room after you were drafted. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Just kind of seeing behind the scenes of how everything works. It was awesome, and I learned a lot. So I I got a call at the time. Um, Chris Buckley was a scouting director and Buck drafted me uh, back in 07 and yeah, somebody else was in the room and they say, hey, I was hurt. So I, I, uh, I had hip surgery, so I wasn't traveling with the team and I was I just at home with my wife. So we were getting on each other's nerves. So they're like, hey, you want to come up <laughs> to the draft room and hang out for a little bit? So I go up there the first day. And Buck was great because, you know, he would kind of ask everybody around the room. So he's calling on me and I'm like, oh, you know, Buck, I don't know. I don't know. This is not uh, this is not where. <laughs> and uh, after the first day, you know, they were up there for four, four to six hours. Um, after the first day, I said, all right, what time are we coming back tomorrow? So they let they let me come and hang out for like yeah 25 straight days and then i was in the room for the draft and by the end of it i was comfortable kind of giving buckley my opinion and i don't know that it was right or wrong at the time i kind of cringed thinking about what i would say right now you know but uh yeah it was it was uh it was a very very eye-opening good experience in in i like that aspect of the scouting side of things because of that you know because i got to see that and that uh that just kind of piqued my interest of like yeah this this is pretty cool the way how you know i think the area scouts are super underappreciated in the job that they have to do you know yeah. like that job is tough and that job is thankless you know those guys are in the room fighting for their guys and they don't even have a chance to draft them, right? Like they're not the ones making the actual pick. So the, that job is as appreciated from my perspective as anything in baseball, just because of the hours and the time and the commitment that those guys have to put in and you, they don't always get to see the payoff, you know? So it, um, it, it was very cool. And I, I, I obviously get to talk to some of those guys now that scouted me and they scouted for uh, the people. So it, it, it's very cool. And I, I'm very appreciative of, you know, that side of the game. Yeah. I mean, I get that too, kind of from the area scout perspective, because even just doing like the limited scouting I do for prospects live and live looks like you see those guys and you're like, Oh, I've had the opportunity to see these guys. This is kind of who I would want my team to go for. It, it, and it's easy to, uh, it's easy to show up to a game and see somebody that everybody likes. Right. But it, yeah. you get, you get to talk to those guys and get to understand what they're actually looking at. And they get to show up to a random game and find some, you know, like they're, they're at another level on this thing. So it, it it's a, uh, it's very cool. That perspective. Yeah. 
Tyler, I'll turn it over to you if you have any other questions before I go into the last one. Um, I guess really my last question is, you know, just have some fun here. What was what was your most fun moment in the majors? Most fun moment in the majors. I would say the so I made the All Star game in two thousand in fourteen there when I had a good year, mm. and I think that not necessarily the game. The game itself was fine, but the 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 final moment of like, hey, you made the All Star team when they announce it in front of the team, and then everybody comes and daps you up, and that was really cool. Where like. Uh, <laughs> This has been a long time coming, a lot of work, a lot of up and downs. And um, the that kind of gratification at that point to, to finally achieve what I, you know, kind of hoped that I would for such a long time was, was very cool. Perfect. That, that's the that's the great thing about teams, too, is everybody that you might you might not think actually has your back. But then you find out you have a moment like that. It's like. That's a rewarding moment right there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Jared, I think that's it. an awesome thing to end on to. Uh, Devin, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us. Um, this has been great just to hear your story and everything that you're doing at Pitt now. Um, and wishing you nothing but the success uh, coming into the 2024 season. All right. Appreciate you guys for having me. Love.